Violence Radio, covering the beat of nonviolence worldwide from the Meta Center for Nonviolence in Petaluma, California. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of Nonviolence Radio. Uh, I am your host, uh, Michael Nagler, and uh, we're very pleased and proud to share with you an interview that I was recently able to conduct with a very dear old friend of mine and a very important actor in the world of nonviolence. This is Mel Duncan, who is the co-founder of Nonviolent Peace Force. Mel has been working tirelessly for something like 15 years now to get Nonviolence Peace Force started and to get it established within the UN and even the United States uh, government appropriations. Uh, Mel came to this work from a background in community organizing, but at the Hague Conference for Peace that he will describe, he met with David Hartso and this thing, which we think so highly of here at Meta, was actually launched. So on to our interview. So Mel, if I could uh, repeat what, what I hear you asking, it's you're working on transitioning our whole security concept really from a, one based on force to one based on trust and community, which is totally laudable, totally what we have to do. And then the secondary question within that is, is this a form of constructive program? And I was saying, absolutely it is. And that will become clear when we actually build the alternative institutions, like the restorative justice uh, instead of the, the, the prison pipeline. And when we uh, provide psychological services that the police force can operate in tandem with, all of that will make it very obvious that it's constructive mm -hmm. program. But the main thing that constructive program will allow us to do, and I think it's huge, is to get out of the blame game and not blame the police purely and simply for the killings. Of course, they shouldn't be doing it, but we have to realize that we've put them in an impossible situation. And, and I'm always reminded of a, a thing that Norman Cousins said, Cousins discovered that the Navy had uh, sent a ship around San Francisco Bay, spraying a bacterial agent into the fog to see if it would work as a bioweapon. And it did. And uh, later on, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, they discovered that uh, an elder gentleman had contracted the illness and died. Mm -hmm. And his grandchildren were suing the Navy. And so Cousins said, this was absolutely reprehensible for the Navy to do that. However, you have to realize when you have made somebody else responsible for your security, you've given away some, I don't know, some ethical prerogative or something. It, it, it's, it's not fair for you then to turn on that person and say, I, I don't like the way you did that. You shouldn't have done it that way. So well, that there are excesses that lead to police brutality, there's no question, and it, and it does have to be stopped. But we have to, above all, avoid the psychological posture of pointing the finger at them and saying, we are blameless and you did this whole thing and mm -hmm. we're going to punish you. That'll get us nowhere. I, I, I understand what you're saying. At the same time, there is a line that I think you crossed in terms of people have to be accountable for their own acts, and we have to hold people accountable. You know, pol policing is a um, profession where bad apples should not be allowed. Just like, this is true. Just like um, you know, Delta Airlines you know, doesn't come out and say, well, you know, uh, we've got really good uh, pilots, except there's a couple of bad apples and they, they like to crash into the mountains. You know, that is a profession where no yeah. bad apples are allowed. And policing should be the same. There is no excuse for a bad apple and there is no excuse for police federations that will protect those bad apples at all costs. And so I think that there is some room for blame. 
and that we didn't do it all. Yeah. No, I, I don't disagree with that, Mel. And, and I'm not saying that there isn't a behavior which really has to stop. But I'm just saying that we can approach it a little more compassionately if we look at the whole mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that after all, the ultimate goal in nonviolence, although it's hard to achieve, this is where you know we have to make a compromise with the real world, that the ultimate goal that we have to achieve is not so much accountability is as persons taking responsibility. You know, the ideal hundred years from now goal would be for the police to readily, willingly, and proudly take that all on themselves. However, you know, there I go again, I'm always holding up the ideal and the, the future paradise in the real world. <laughs> Yeah, well, Delta Airlines and the police profession has to do their job correctly. But I guess the only thing that I feel strongly about that I'm arguing against is the feeling that once we've gotten to do that, we have solved the problem and we had no yeah. buy-in yeah. of our own. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Let me unpack what you just said about that the absolute goal of non- uh, nonviolence is not accountability, but people taking responsibility. And so what I think, what I heard in that is that accountability is after the fact and that responsibility is proactive. Yeah, that is true. Now that you, I hadn't thought of that, but there's another element to it uh, in that in accountability, we're not giving them the agency. We're, we're not giving them the opportunity to step up, recognize what they did, and self-correct, which is the ultimate goal. But it's always good. It's always good to have a distant shining goal, mm -hmm. even if you're not able to live up to it in the present, in your lifetime. Oh, yes. Izzy Stone said, uh, to find the answers to your questions in your lifetime, you're not asking big enough questions. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Oh, he was so great. Yeah. So, Mel, this actually takes us right into the question of uh, an armed civilian peacekeeping because uh, it's not surprising to me the way your uh, splendid organization, Nonviolent Peace Force, has adapted itself to domestic interventions, having started with the traditional model of cross border which wasn't actually what Gandhi had in mind. When you get right down to it, it, it was right. all community-based. Yep. So- We use let, the word me... term Shanti Sena liberal, liberally. Yes, that's right. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, in India, Sena didn't mean a foreign occupying force necessarily. <laughs> you have Shiv Sena is going on right now. Uh, so let me ask you these two questions. How did you, get a passion for peace and how did it uh, end up focusing on this this uh, aspect that we now call an armed civilian peacekeeping i have had that passion for as long as i remember and was acting on that passion by junior high school well wow. and by high school was actively organizing around mm. civil rights and mm -hmm. uh, anti-war. I was the only white kid in my high school who walked out uh, the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated uh, wow. along with the black students. Wow. Um, and that was always just a part of me. One of my closest friends who still is, she's an Anam, Anamkara. Do you know that? Uh, it, oh, yeah, a, a Celtic. Yeah, yeah soul friend, John O'Donoghue yeah. who wrote about it. And she and I have been together since we were in cribs. We were in the same nursery uh, yeah. as infants. And she, she has said to me many times, you were just born with different filters. <laughs> and you cannot filter out the pain the way most people can. And thank God for that. Well, it's, it's, been excruciating too. I mean, I, I, oh yeah, 
I understand it. I accept it. I'm not sure I'd wish it upon anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that was a motivation. Plus, this is not so. Um, uh, I mean, maybe this is too revealing, but I, I was brought up with a mother who, who gave me responsibility for everything. And um, also reinforced in me that I could do anything I put my mind to. So, uh, you know, here I am working <laughs> on a nonviolent peace force when I'm 70. <laughs> what a mom. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was for good and, and ill. You know, uh, that wasn't all good. And so I had worked my entire life primarily domestically on uh, human rights issues, on uh, disability rights, gay rights, uh, on economic justice, organizing, um, helping to organize my dear friend, Paul Wellstone's Senate campaign. And it was yeah. 18 years ago, Sunday when they died. Um, wow. 18 years ago. <sighs> I remember them so fondly. Yeah. And so I, you've heard me tell, tell this before, and, I, and if it's passe, let, let me know. But I always, by that time, I was organizing uh, I, just a classical community organizer, us versus them, right versus wrong, good versus evil, 50% plus one means, means we kick their ass. Um, now, I was a little more civil about it, but not much. So then I wind up at the University of Creation Spirituality mm -hmm. uh, in 1997. And I'm sitting in a class on the mystics. And we had just started a section on Rumi, which was being mm. taught by a Supi. <laughs> and she started out the class by talking about the difference between Western style debate and Eastern style, where in the West, you try to dominate the other person in the East. And these are over, over generalizations. In the East, you try to illuminate what the other person is saying. Now, you and I know better than that, um, but <laughs> for general purpose. With that, I started daydreaming about when I used to be on a, uh, a public television show back here in Minnesota on Friday nights. And I was part of a panel where we were on for eight to 10 minutes at the end of the show to argue about the events of the week. Hmm. And we were encouraged uh, to mix it up, to be controversial. Um, I mean, we are nothing. This was uh, over 20 <laughs> years ago. We're nothing to what's on now, but we were precursors. Mm -hmm. And Georgia confronted me one night. Mm -hmm. She was waiting for me at the door when I came home and she'd watched the show, something that I had expected all my family to do dutifully do every Friday that I was on. And that <laughs> never happened, but she had watched it and said to me, there's nothing, there was nothing good about you tonight, but your shirt. Hmm. Uh, and it was a shirt she had bought for me. And of course, <laughs> she said, how are you contributing to the public good? By arguing with people, by interrupting people, by trying to best them. What are you even modeling for our children? And, you know, I want to say, but, but Georgia, this is a good gig. You know, people, people recognize me in the, in the uh, grocery store. So I'm dreaming about this and I come to in this class in downtown Oakland and this Sufi is staring right in my face. Mm. I'd never met her before. And she said, and your job is to enter the heart of your enemy. And I wrote in my notebook, enter the heart of my enemy. That's a good place to rip it out. Mm. And then further down the page, I wrote, don't go back to sleep. This could change your life. Wow. wow. And at that point, truly when the student's ready, the teachers appear. Oh yeah. And so I was led, mentored, goaded, challenged, depending on who it was, about 
the dualistic way that I saw uh, the world, the dualistic way that I worked, and really was being pulled into understanding my work from a sense of unity. And that led me to um, take part in a sangha in the Bay Area for social uh, activists uh, up off of Fruit Vale. It led me to uh, study Thich Nhat Hanh. And a uh, little over a year later, I was sitting in Plum Village. Yeah. And Thich Nhat Hanh, um, I was on this fellowship from this mainstream foundation back in Minnesota. And by that point, they were just <laughs> throwing up their hands <laughs> when they get my bi-monthly report. And so I'm at this monastery, monastery and there Thich Nhat Hanh was very clear about we were no longer at the place where we could afford to take sides. The stakes were mm. too high. Mm. And so that was late 1998. And leaving Plum Village on a bus, I wrote in my ever-present notebook um, a thought piece on a nonviolent peace force. Wow. And That's how it started. So I came home, I, I actually went back up to, to Edinburgh to finish out my fellowship and hung out with a buddy and wrote during the day and would go to the pubs at night. And I, but I had an uh, email again. So I wrote Georgia this idea and she wrote back, good idea, promise you'll stay home for, for three months. So I came home at the end of 98, we were broke. She had gone back to work, thankfully. And I was teaching at the university and doing consulting and other things. And this vision wouldn't leave me. And mm. so one night, Georgia said, just go for it. And the next mm. day, there was an, a little, it was actually an advert in the nation mm. uh, about this Hague Appeal for Peace that was coming up. Ah. And so I looked into it, and I thought, well, as an organizer, that's a good place to test out the currency of this idea. So I mm. raised enough money to get a plane ticket, found a free place to stay in The Hague. And I was off with 50 sheets of single spaced uh, <laughs> I, typing on this concept of a nonviolent peace force. And I, after a day I panicked because, were you there at that? I wasn't, no. I knew about it, but I wasn't there. They had planned for 5,000 people and instead there were 9,000 people. Mm. And so every venue was jammed and um, one showed up early or you just um, fit into the, you, you, you watch the event at, at, on video. So I called George after the first night and I said, you know, these people are giving me money and, you know, uh, to check this idea out. I can't get a foothold. I, I can't talk to anybody. I, I could stand up on a chair and start yelling and, you know, I just fit into the din. And she said, well, then be quiet and listen. <laughs> so the next day, I'm crammed against the back wall of a room. And uh, I, I know now that the speaker was uh, Helga Temple that, that was up there. I, I didn't know him then, but David Grant was there. Uh, and uh, I think Tim Wallace was there. And uh, this guy gets up and asks a question about a large scale professional nonviolent peace force. And I shook my head like in the cartoons. I pushed through the wall or through the crowd and I grabbed him by the arm. And I said, if you're serious about what you just said, we have to go out in the hall and start organizing. Uh, we only have a few days here. So can you imagine saying to Dave, David Hart, so if you're serious about what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> He must have given you quite a look. <laughs> um, so we were out in the hallway organizing groups to test this idea. And uh, coming away from there, we wrote a concept note and then spent the next couple of years maxing out our credit cards, visiting people in violent conflicts and learning what they were doing that was working and what, if anything, they might need from well-trained unarmed civilians. Yeah. So that's a long story. 
I've, I've never heard the story in quite that fullness, Mel, starting from uh, starting from those filters. And uh, I'm getting a very strong impression listening to you and listening to it of this perfect combination between internal and external factors. In other words, you're getting the best mentors from Sufi teacher to Georgia and everything else. And on the other hand, you're not just saying, oh, you know, the universe will take care of it. You're doing your due diligence. You're going in there with the 50 pages. You're grabbing David Hartso by the arm. So that is the winning combination. I think we can all take a really inspiring lesson from all of that. So let, let's back up a second. Uh, you, you had this idea more or less come to you spontaneously, the idea of nonviolent intervention, but it had a bit of a history by then. Right. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Dana before. Where, can yeah, you tell us a little book. bit about that? Well, um, in 1984, I had gone to Nicaragua as mm -hmm. part of the International Brigadistas. And uh, we stayed in a uh, village in, in the cotton fields on the nor northern border, right on the Gulf of Fonseca. And those villages were being attacked and destroyed by the uh, Contra during yeah. the cotton and coffee harvest. And we surmised that that was a CIA operation. We didn't know. Um, and furthermore, that if there were gringos or northern Europeans in those villages, the CIA wouldn't allow the Contra to attack. Thank God we were right. Um, you know, that came out two years later in the Iran Contra hearings. And no one was ever killed when they were doing that nonviolent uh, presence in those villages. There was one young, young man that, that was killed, but he had taken up arms. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. And so I had seen the utility of this and how it might work, mm -hmm. but George and I had, hadn't been married very long and we were starting a family. And as you know, it became a very large family. Mm -hmm. And so I would have this idea niggling in the back of my mind. And I had started studying Gandhi I guess in early college, as well as uh, King and uh, others. I remember Stoughton Lynn's anthology of nonviolence oh. in America. And so I had these thoughts rolling around. And I remember during the Balkan Wars thinking, you know, is there something we can do here? Um, yeah. But of course, never had the, the time or the intention, the, um, drive to do anything the time wasn't quite right yeah but driving away from plum village you know i was sitting on that bus and just wrote it was just all right there uh -huh. yeah you know i want to pick up on one particular point that you mentioned uh mel about you know being impressed that nobody was killed while they were doing this uh there's a right way and a wrong way to react to that. Uh, I, I remember when I started going around trying to raise money for this kind of work, I don't think NP existed yet. I spoke to Sally Lilienthal who uh, had quite a bit of funding here in San Francisco and, and I pitched the idea to her with the support of some well-off funding friends from the East and uh, she said, well, you know, the first time anybody gets killed, it'll all collapse. Yeah. And I knew that was dead wrong. So I've thought about this a lot. And what I've come to is, on the one hand, we mustn't get into this work in order to protect ourselves, because that's the wrong motivation. We do it because we want to protect others. We do it because we feel it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. You cannot not be a risk taker in nonviolence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know <that> way. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, it does show that there's an incredible power in this thing, which because of our worldview, our paradigm that we were referencing earlier, we don't see that power. And so it becomes a critically important part of the uh, argument is to show people that no, this has the power both to 
persuade the opponent and to uh, you know yeah to protect you and your and uh, your side so it has that power but it'd be wrong to say i'm going to do it nonviolently because i'm scared <laughs> so it's it's a maybe a, a kind of a subtle point but i thought it'd be worth be worth making and seeing if you agree with it well um first of all we do have a much higher risk threshold than most people and uh, that's taught to people in training. But that doesn't mean we don't have a risk threshold. Yeah. Because we do. Martyrdom is not a sustainable activity. Uh, well put. And so uh, we do uh, protect ourselves uh, when, and if we cannot protect ourselves, we can't protect others. Good and point. One of the things that's that's been a good learning is that often in the field, the blur of who's protecting who, it, it becomes blurred about who's protecting who. And at times, the people in the villages are protecting us, and at other times, we're protecting them. And I think that that is the ideal mutuality of nonviolent protection. That, that is really wonderful to hear. I had, yeah, that again is an aspect I hadn't thought of, but uh, it definitely protects us from what we used to fear so much and rightly, which is peace imperialism. You know, we're, we're, we're coming in there to give you people peace because you can't do it yourself. So I, I know that NP has a policy, uh, so does PBI and other organizations that do this kind of work the policy of leaving when they're no longer needed. But what you're saying here is is more intimate and more powerful mm -hmm. that we're we're in it together. You know, we're really yep. they're protecting yep. us, we're protecting them. Good point. Yeah. Well for and, our and uh, uh, one point on the peace imperialism. Um yeah. we still need to be challenged on that and challenge ourselves mm -hmm. because we do reinforce colonial and racist patterns, sometimes by the work that we do. You know, we will choose the ethnicity, the race, the religion, the age, whatever the identity of that person is, if they can protect the person that we're trying to protect, that's the person who's chosen. But at so, the same time, though, excuse me, at the same time, beyond other organizations in the field that I know of, NP has done a superb job of trying to put out mixed teams. Oh yeah, so, always. Yeah. yeah. So you're not just uh, Global North parachuting in to defend the Global South. So you've no. gone far, I think, to strike that balance between, yes, we do have something we can offer you, uh, and no, we're not here to tell you how to do it and, and to imply that you are helpless. Right. I think right. that's one of the great successes of Nonviolent Peace Force. Yeah. Working with the agency of, of the people. That's why I never talk about capacity building anymore. Mm. I always refer to it as capacity recognition. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know we interviewed uh, recently for our film a, a fellow from Kenya, Gregory Ocheno, and he spoke very feelingfully about the indigenous mechanisms of conflict reduction yeah. and community building, which were overwhelmed, unfortunately, in the colonial era. But, uh, but that's ideally what we want to be doing, capacity recognition and maybe some capacity enhancement where we have yeah. the capacity to do that. And the metaphor that I think about sometimes, Michael, is do you, do you remember Andrew Weil? Yeah, he, he wrote it, several books. Uh, uh, one was called Spontaneous Healing. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how we really have within our bodies the ability to heal ourselves. And he mm -hmm. said, so when you cut yourself, you can watch and see your body starting to knit itself mm -hmm. back together immediately. We have those properties within us. But sometimes the assault is so acute, either externally or internally, that we need additional help 
but not mm -hmm. to heal us. Mm -hmm. We need the additional help to get back to the place where we can heal ourselves. That's a superb metaphor. And you know, one of the things we've experienced here on our property in, in West Marin, so when we came to this place, there were two very serious erosion ditches. We noticed that they had a lot of thistles. And we thought, oh, you know, thistles are such a pain. You try to walk through them, you get stung. But the thistles were nature's scar tissue. They, they, they kept the cows from making things worse in those erosion ditches. So it's like, you know, the planet also has an ability to heal. That, yeah. And it does. That, it oh, does yeah. <laughs> But it does need some help when, of course, it's been artificially interfered with. Yeah. So, Mel, uh, it strikes me that, uh, you know, you, you and I have been in this field for so long and we know the mechanics of it, but a lot of people uh, reading or watching this interview may not. So could you sketch for us what exactly you do in uh, unarmed civilian peacekeeping? Well, we have teams of well-trained unarmed civilian peacekeepers who come from both, both the host country where we're invited and from now I think it's 40 other countries. Uh -huh. And we are invited by local civil society into areas of violent conflict to work with them to protect civilians and prevent violence. And so we have 10 methods that we use in different proportions to provide protection for uh, individuals and communities. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, we've been doing this good practices process that I know you're aware of. And one of the, my learnings so far is that unarmed civilian protection is highly dependent upon deep community engagement where we, together do ongoing context analysis. Based upon that, the one or more of the methods are applied and we work with the community on whether that be accompaniment or early warning, early response or interpositioning. And we have to be very nimble because conflict dynamics change mm -hmm. quickly. And so we have to be able to change that. And it, it it that occurred to me a few years ago, more than a few years ago, when I was visiting various sites in South Sudan. Mm. And I, I would look and think, this site is doing something completely different than the one I just visited. <laughs> and it was because of the context. And so we really require that deep community engagement and ongoing interaction. And so mm -hmm. what I've come to understand is that unarmed civilian protection is much more of a process than a prescription. Mm. Uh, it's not a recipe book. It is uh, a process that is dynamic and is systems based. At the same time, Mel, the, even when you have a recipe book, you have to have some recognizable ingredients. Yeah. Uh, someone says, you know, mix in half a dozen eggs you got to know what an egg is and where That's so right. so would you would, would you say a little bit more about what some of the methods are you mentioned yeah. uh interpositioning and you you mentioned uh rumor abatement what are just a couple of the others to give people a well, sense accompaniment is um probably the best known of the methods uh, that yeah. we use and that is where uh for example in south sudan uh, women who are staying in internal refugee camps, they're called protection of civilian areas. They can become very large. Uh, one place where we work, there's 100,000 people. And the women have to leave every day to collect firewood. And because they've been in those camps now for six years, there's massive defoliation. So they have to go further and further into the bush. It, it's gotten better since the peace agreement. But until then, and it still happens, but not to the extent, the um, women would be routinely raped. They would be raped by the government soldiers. They would be raped by the rebel groups. 
rape was weaponized. It was used to exert territory, control, revenge. And this was working conditions that women were discussing with each other. Sometimes they'd say, well, we'll send the oldest women because they're less likely to be raped. Mm. And what we found is that if we sent three to five of our unarmed civilian protectors with 20 to 30 women, they were never attacked. Wonderful. In a, in a four year period, there was one instance where one of our people was attacked by a drunk soldier, um, mm. but none of the women were ever attacked. It's more dramatic right after the Civil War reemerged in 2013, going into 2014. It became very quickly ethnicized. You know, and this is not a war against, oh, these tribes can't get along. These, this is a war against kleptocrats who are very clever about ethnicizing things and ripping old wounds open very quickly. Mm. Um, and so it quickly became ethnicized. And one group was cut off from an airport where they had to escape by a opposing tribe and to get to the airstrip airport. <laughs> that kind of overstates it, it's like a gravel strip. Um, so to get to the airstrip, they would have to go through the, you know, this new air people, they would have to go through the Dinka area. And so for three months, Tandy from Zimbabwe, Jiva from Sri Lanka, and um, Olo from Kenya made many trips a day, ferrying mm. people through that area. And as long as they were with them, they would not get hassled. You know, there were a couple of examples where, you know, they were pulled out of the car but they were able to, to save over a thousand people. Wow. And as, as I understand it, they have some recognizable uniform that they're all identifying. Visibility is critical. Visibility yeah. is critical. And we also create relationships with all the armed parties. So they know who uh, we are. So, you know, if we, if we sneak up on someone in the field and surprise someone, we mm. haven't done our work. We, surprises don't we don't do well by i remember seeing in a film of uh, some pbi people in colombia if i'm not mistaken sitting down with the army to tell them who they were and oh, what yeah. they were doing in that area and you could see the army was uh, they were startled they had never heard of this kind of thing before but yeah. they sure were glad to know who these people were and what they were doing yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's another important point. That kind of communication so, is key. Yeah. So uh, Mel, moving on from the actual field, though, I, in fact, what I'm going to ask you to say in a little bit is to briefly tell us the story of Derek and Andres in, in South Sudan. We can't end without telling that. Maybe we'll end on that. But I know that in terms of the incredible due diligence that NP has been doing, uh, the part of it that impresses me the most, I think, is the learning, uh, the collection of best practices. I mean, I used to be so frustrated about this. I would say in the 80s, say, you know, we go out there and we risk our lives and we do these incredible dramatic things and nobody ever hears about it. And the next time we do it, we got to start inventing the wheel. I used to say, bank robbers do more best practices and debriefing. <laughs> but that situation has certainly changed. And I'm mm -hmm. absolutely thrilled in the way that uh, some groups are explicitly using the experiences of other countries who have uh, had an insurrection when there was an illegitimate election to uh, advise us to, to some of the things that work and, and that, that don't work. So would you tell us a little bit about that, that, that very systematic, I think it was six continent collection mm -hmm. of resources that you've done and where we can go to read about the results? Uh, we embarked upon a good practices. We aren't um, bold enough to call them best yet. We started with in, uh, very intense case studies of four 
applications of unarmed civilian protection, mm. one in Mindanao, one in South Sudan, where nonviolent peace force is very active, one in Israel-Palestine, where we aren't, and another, the fourth in Colombia, where we've not been. So we really got to see probably the work of 25 different groups. Wow. Uh, uh, because Colombia, Colombia, Palestine, and Guatemala are the hot hubs, you know, where there's more work that's been done than any place else. Mm -hmm. And so based upon that, we, uh, Ellen Fernari uh, led this up, but we had different research teams. John Lindsay Poland was on the team that went to Colombia. Uh, um, yeah, good. We identified 77 best, best practices by doing cross case analysis. And some of them were really obvious. Like, I, I, this might not be exactly right, but interview people before you hire them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, not everybody was doing that. You know, you, you, they took who they could get. Uh, that's not a good practice. Right. But there were other things that, that were much more substantial. And so then the second phase, which we're really finishing up, was where we have convened practitioners, partners, a few people who uh, we partnered with who have received our services and a few academics on a regional basis and gone through a three-day guided retreat to really bring out from people what they're doing that works, in what context, you know, where are the dilemmas, where are the conflicts, and so we've done that in East Asia. We've done it in the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, North America, and Latin America. And then COVID hit. Uh, so we have Europe, Europe left. We're putting, the, putting together a workshop for Europe. And then we will do an international gathering to come together and to really look at what works, what doesn't work what can be replicated, what can be scaled up, and mm -hmm. most importantly, to cultivate a community of practice. Because uh. there are more of us. I, I, I use the term that there's at least 50 organizations in the world doing some form of unarmed civilian protection in 24 locations. But, mm. you know, we've been doing training in Minneapolis for peacekeepers at the poll for the election. And, mm -hmm. you know, here's this group, the Powderhorn Security Collective. Mm -hmm. And they have been providing security in the neighborhoods adjacent to where uh, George Floyd was murdered since last June. They are doing UCP. Yeah. You know, they just didn't know it. And so I think what's happening is rather a zeitgeist that this is coming up because it's required and people are understanding and sensing at a very different level that we have to reshape the way we do security. And so mm -hmm. what, this goal, Michael, the Powderhorn Security Collective, one of the things that they try to do is to intervene before 911 is called because ah. good things don't happen often to people in those neighborhoods when 911 is called. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very constructive approach. Yeah. And you know, I would venture that there's hundreds of those operations around the world. Yeah, I think we all could name off a few, you know, one in the Bronx, one in Chicago, yeah. are the famous ones. Now, here's the, that leads me to ask you this really uh, I think kind of critical question. You mentioned the zeitgeist and we know that at a certain point to be conscious of what you're doing, to have a name for it, it helps significantly to pull it together and create a coherent, identifiable thrust. Do you see some of that happening internationally and domestically, or is it just these, you know, scattered groups spontaneously coming up with an idea? And some of that's happening. You know, we have the Shanti Sena network that right. you know in North America. In Latin America, they are they come together once a year. Uh -huh. uh, this um, network, um, but all the work seems to be between Mexico and Colombia, and we haven't come upon a common name, and we have mm -hmm. to be very careful because people 
are skeptical about what we're doing is NP trying to take over everything. We're trying to do much the opposite. We're trying to <laughs> stimulate a lot of groups doing this. We came upon the, the term unarmed civilian protection primarily so that we could work at the UN and advance this as policy. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, I didn't mean a, a, a single organization, but I, I think what you're talking about is exactly what I did mean, which is a single concept. Mm -hmm. Did you realize you're speaking prose kind of thing? Yeah. <laughs> So Mel, you mentioned a uh, magic word there. Could you very briefly tell us what you've done at the UN, you in, you in particular? I'm going to misquote Gandhi in front okay. of you because I think he didn't say this, but he's been credited with first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then yeah. they fight you, and then you win. Now, right. I've been told he really didn't say that. Do you know? Well, we really don't know who said it. It's been attributed to a number of people, but it's it's so good. <laughs> yeah. And so we followed that line uh, at the UN. David Hartso and I went to the UN in the fall of 1999 with this idea, with these flyers. And there were only five people who would see us. Anne Roll Chowdhury, Cora Weiss, Chris Coleman, Gay Rosenblum Kumar. But you know, I, I literally was handing out flyers to the volunteers in the UNICEF shop because at least they had time to talk. And so we were ignored. And then we got to a stage, you know, we just were persistent. And 2005, 2006, we would get the response, oh, we're sure that this works to protect a few human rights defenders. And, and that's important. But there's really no policy implication here. And so we went through that stage. And then in 2015, when the high level independent panel on peace operations, you know, did this global review and came back and said strongly and in bold type that the UN unarmed approaches must be in the forefront of the UN's work on protecting civilians. That right. caught a lot of people by surprise. Not only the UN agencies who were, you know, barely tolerating us, but also um, some of the NGOs who opposed us. And then, so that started to be the time of fighting us, you know, yeah. and and fighting in a diplomatic sense where you're never sure, but then you find out something happened. Then at the end of 2016. We, for the first time, got unarmed civilian protection into a Security Council resolution, which is a mm -hmm. lot of work, a lot of work. That means China didn't veto it, Russia didn't veto it, the US didn't veto it. And a person from a very large NGO came up to me the day that it was decided. And as an aside, Michael, it was Angola and Venezuela who were our proponents. Wow. And they were the main proponent behind the scenes was the UK. Wow. And the UK always acted as they, that they're our ally. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it was Angola and Venezuela. And I know because the Venezuelan guy was texting me in real time <laughs> saying, what should I do now? And um, <laughs> so this representative of a large NGO, Oxfam, stalked me out of a room. And I was with a colleague. Um, from NP who was shadowing me that week. So, so she heard this too. And this woman came up and shook her finger in, in my face <laughs> and was angry. I, I don't know when the last time I've had a finger sh shaken in my face. And she said, I want you to know the, the outcome of your advocacy. There are now ambassadors on the Security Council who are saying, why don't we send unarmed peacekeepers instead of armed peacekeepers? And that's because of you. <laughs> Tisk tisk. <laughs> oh, you're yeah, right. mayor. <laughs> can, can you can you put that in writing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is funny. And so then, um, people had to take us more and more seriously. And now, you know, just a couple months ago, the Security Council resolution for the transition in Darfur, as mm -hmm. the armed troops leave into a political mission 
mentioned unarmed civilian protection twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what happened in the fourth stage was not exactly we won, <laughs> but it's illustrated by we were able to get a two hour hearing before the uh, Security Council in mm -hmm. December of 2017. Mm -hmm. And at the end, the director of research for the Department of Peacekeeping spoke. And this is a guy that I've tussled with for years, but he, he usually just dismissed me. He got up after hearing Tiffany, after hearing mm -hmm. Kutsi, one of our field people who had, had been a UN police officer and then mm. came to us so she could give the contrast very quickly. And so after hearing all of that, I, the International Peace Institute presented it basically in favor of unarmed approaches. David Hayeri, the director of research got up and said, I don't disagree with anything that's been said. <laughs> and then he said, and we're already doing that. So that's their tack now. Yeah. Oh, what's yeah. New, what's new about this? We've been doing this. Yeah. Well, it seems to me, Mel, if there ever was an idea whose time has come, it came. And if there ever was a person who could step up and make that idea happen, it was you. So by way of just wrapping up, if you could just tell us briefly, so folks have a feeling for what unarmed protection can do, tell us what did happen in, in that camp, in that UN uh, IDP camp in Bohr with Derek and Andres. In Bohr, you, you remembered it was Bohr. Well, it, that happened uh, a few months after the uh, Civil War reignited. So it was like April of 2014. And they were in this they were really makeshift camps that sprung up around UN conclaves. And a number of rebels came over the berm and came into the camp and started shooting people point blank. Derek and Andreas were with 14 women and children. And so they went to a hut-like structure and stood in the doorway as the women and children were inside. And on three occasions, young rebels came up to them and screamed profanities and uh, you have no business being here, we want those people and on and on, pointing AK-47s at their heads. And on three occasions, Derek and Andreas held up their nonviolent Peace Force identity card and said, we are unarmed, we are here to protect civilians and we will not leave. Hmm. After the third time, these young rebels left. Hmm. And Derek and Andreas could hear them as they went back to join the group, say, stay away from up there, leave those people alone. In the debrief, Andreas says very clearly, if we would have had a gun, we probably would have been shot. Oh, yeah. 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 We captured that part in our film. Yeah, that's in the film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We loved using that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I can't imagine uh, a more dramatic and clear illustration, demonstration of the power of nonviolence uh, by people who are dedicated and well-trained and well-organized and even not too badly funded, though <laughs> that can yeah. always yeah. need some help. So that is a wonderful, wonderful note. And uh, I want to thank you, Mel, not only for this interview, but for the 20 years of work that yeah. <laughs> led up to it. And I, I still have the feeling that uh, I used to get a little pushback from you but about 20 years ago when I used to say this, but I still have a feeling that this is going to replace the war system someday. <laughs> yeah. And I remember 20 years ago riding in David Hartso's car to come over to see you for the first time and literally shaking. And thinking, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. What, what in the world do I have to say to this guy? I mean, what value added could I be? Uh, <laughs> this is this is rich. This is really rich. Here's somebody who faces down AK-47s in Mindanao, being afraid to visit a professor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I was. <laughs> I'm flattered, Mel. I'm flattered. <laughs> we we just uh, owe you guys the world. We're so glad you're there, at Shanti Sena Network, and all the yeah. rest. Of yeah. I love you, Michael. And I love you. Put, put that in the 
interview. That, that, oh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> we'll see what the editors say about that. All right. Good uh, talking with you. Good talking with you, friend. Take All care. Right. Bye bye. You've been listening to Nonviolence Radio. I'm your host, Michael Nagler, and just conducted an interview with our friend and uh, organizer, Mel Duncan, the co founder of Nonviolent Peace Force. You can find out more about Nonviolent Peace Force at one word, nonviolencepeaceforce.org. And of course, more about the Meta Center at metacenter.org. And that's, that is Meta with two T's. I'd like to thank our mother station, KWMR, coming to you out of uh, Port Ray Station in California. And uh, let's meet again in two weeks.